Well, good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this AHUA webinar on the subject of the future student experience. My name is Catherine Webb, and I'm Executive Secretary of the AHUA, and I'm delighted to introduce this webinar organised in partnership with PA Consulting and our speakers for this afternoon, Rob Mettler and Natalie Taylor. Rob is a digital expert with PA Consulting with 25 years of digital experience across a range of sectors. He believes in the power of silo busting and customer centered approaches. Natalie is also a digital expert with PA Consulting with 15 years of public sector digital expertise. She's delivered major digital transformation projects, including nhs.uk, gov.uk and london.gov.uk. So you're in very good hands and it's my great pleasure to hand over to Natalie to start the presentation. Now I'm going to give you a little bit of a taster of what we've got coming up in the next hour. So to start with, we're going to talk about why things need to change for universities and not just because of COVID-19. Then we're going to look at what a 2020-2021 student experience might look like. We're then going to talk a little bit about how to accelerate delivery for this new normal that we're starting to experience. And then finally, we'll have a question and answer session. Now, when we were originally planning to run this seminar back in April, we'd all have been face to face discussing the changing education landscape and looking at how universities have survived a series of threats, including fee-based funding, the online threat of MOOCs, potential decline in school leaders, and alternative study modes. And we reflect that despite those threats, student numbers and revenues have largely grown over the last decade. We might then have looked at this graph from the FT and concluded that the biggest challenge will be competition for overseas and high tariff students and the need to recruit and retain them. And in the spirit of that mutual competition, we then focus on how delivery of a differentiated experience would be key to attract and retain those high value students. We then have looked at this insight on the expectations people have on how they're engaged and served. I'm going to pick out three examples here. Customers, people, 79% expecting their services, their digital experience to be delivered through mobile. 66% of them expecting to have an omnichannel experience, one in which they can switch between the physical and digital domains seamlessly. And 72% of them expecting those services to be personalized, tailored for their needs, using their data for their advantage. And we would have then taken you through an exemplar student experience for the digital age. Now, back in March, these points would have been important to the success of your organizations. And over the next 40 minutes, we can explain why they are now critical. As we know, the world has significantly changed since March when we were planning this. It's been up, turned upside down for all of us. And for some of us, us and those we know, the consequences have been far worse. Yes, COVID-19 has turned things upside down. Campuses have been shut down with a need to switch millions of students and thousands of staff to digital platforms almost overnight. And if the challenges of operating today and tomorrow weren't bad enough, the uncertainty and complications of the new student year loom strongly, bringing with it an almost inevitable drop in overseas students, the impacts on research and international programs, the disruption to A-level results, and I speak as a parent of an 18-year-old son in his last year of sixth form, and that's bringing with it uncertainty and when you expect to return to campus and what that return to campus might mean and all of that bringing a potential impact and uncertainty on the 2020 and 2021 student numbers. Yet against this backdrop of challenge and threat, we've also seen positives. The ability of many of you to adapt to a remarkable situation at speed. The speed of delivery of new digital platforms for staff and student in days, not the months hitherto expected the collaboration across institutions to fight the virus, 
and in some cases the reappropriation of accommodation for frontline workers. But none of us know when this will end. What we do know is uncertainty will continue for some time yet. And that a new normal would demand the need to deliver an omnichannel experience for student and staff alike. The ability to operate both in the digital and the physical worlds will be essential. And you will need to do that in a way which ensures they can coexist and be seamlessly moved between. No one can risk creating a digital silo alongside a physical one. We can learn from retailers like John Lewis who have transformed to deliver their omnichannel experience for their customers. And PA has helped them do that. An omnichannel world in which customers can start journeys in one channel, switch to another channel and then back again is key. This ensures those customers are retained and delighted throughout and enables organizations like John Lewis to continue to trade in today's lockdown world. So creating an exemplar experience for application, applicants and students adjusted to the new normal will be as important for you as it is for them in these uncertain times. And we must remain aware that this uncertainty brings with it increased levels of anxiety and potential isolation. We must be fully aware and prepared for an increased focus on well-being if we are to attract and retain students in these uncertain times. Now, given the events of the last few months, we wanted to do a quick poll on how well prepared you felt for this new normal. A poll will shortly appear on your screens. Please select the statement that most resonates with you. Thank you all for responding so promptly. It's great to see these numbers moving in real time, isn't it? So we're well at 75%. Uh, please uh, please uh, select if you haven't already, but I'll start to go through this. I think as we anticipated, I don't think anyone could feel set and ready because of the uncertainty we see. And I think as we might have anticipated earlier on, the majority of people have started to execute, but we're all unsure of what we really need in the future. And some of you are largely in planning at the moment. Thank you for being so candid uh, with that feedback. Um, I'm sure we'll share this, uh, this data with you uh, later on, but I think that uh, positions us well to move into the next stage and really look at what the target student experience could be for this new world. So moving on, we're going to talk to you now about the target student experience. Target student experience mapping lies at the heart of our practice. It paints a picture of the future, better student experiences, and shows how digital can improve delivery both on and offline. It's creative, it's collaborative, and it's fast. Our clients use this process to rapidly develop their digital strategy, re-architect their end-to-end -end customer experience, rally stakeholders and design new products and services. It's been used to clearly articulate the North Star around which global programmes of digital transformation have been delivered by leadership teams at organisations such as Cambridge Assessments, Glasgow University and Anglia Ruskin University. It makes the highly complex simple by using a visual language and process that everyone can contribute to and anyone can understand. And importantly, it puts people first, ensuring that a tangible, demonstrably better experience for users is the driving force for change. Expressing this as a picture shows the intended ambition of the organisation instantly and simply and serves as an effective coordinating focal point for combined action across operational silos and regions. You can see a screenshot of the target student experience on this slide. And I'm going to go into it in more detail so you can see it properly, don't worry. So a target student experience has the following key features. It's from the student's point of view. It covers both on and offline, so it, sh so it shows all kinds of interactions. It's a story, a linear narrative. 
And it's showing the target state. It shows the ambition, the to be rather than the as is. It's simple. It has a cartoon like simplicity. And it also shows the whole life cycle. It shows the entire student journey. So for the purposes of today, we've created a target student experience for a student who's going to attend an imaginary university called ACME. We'd like to walk you through to illustrate how user-centered design and digital technology could transform the way universities provide for their students in the future. So if you can just bear with me a moment, I'm gonna switch over to our Miro board so I can show you the detail. Okay. So this student, this target student experience was informed by uh, workshops that we carried out with current students, prospective students and past students, and also desk research. So I'm going to start by introducing you to the protagonist, the main character who we're going to follow throughout her student journey. So we usually try and pick a character who is representative of the target student experience and encapsulates everything that we want to focus on for the purpose of the exercise. So Sam is based on a real person. Um, she is a sixth form student from Yorkshire. She's chosen the University of Acme in southwest England as her first choice and gets in because she achieves the grades they set her back in May. She's chosen to study biology and live in halls, which with lots of other things she still needs to pick. This will be the first time she's lived away from Yorkshire. She's concerned about how COVID-19 will disrupt her overall university and learning experience. She hopes that the University of Acme has fully understood these concerns and has been actively preparing to make her experience as good as any other year. We'll also meet these other secondary characters as we run through. Sarah, her tutor, Olivia, an academic buddy, and Dr. Harrison, who's a clinical advisor. Natalie, apologies for um, interrupting, but I think the screen may have frozen. Don't know if there's... Ah. Okay, I can try... Try resharing, Natalie. Okay. Um... Can you let me know if you can see that? Yes, I can see that, yeah. Did, okay, so could you see anything that I was just talking about before? No. no okay, fine. So um, I'll just... I'll just recap. This is, so this is the overview of the target student experience here. Um, and then I just drilled down in to show you Sam on the left hand side here and the other three secondary characters that I mentioned. So I'm just going to give you a very high level walkthrough um, so that you get the idea of what this looks like. So first of all, we have a, a finding your feet stage, preparing for university. So this takes us from the moment that Sam discovers that she has a place at Acme University and it helps her to prepare and take all the actions that she needs to take before she actually can join and start in September. We then move into settling in the on campus experience. So this covers Sam's initial welcome, arriving at university, settling into her course, signing up to various societies, understanding the social side and the student union, etc., and starting to get into her studies. Then we have a stage which is about fulfilling her potential, teaching and learning. So this is the academic phase and looks at the various um, innovations that we can use to support Sam in her studies at the university. Then we move through into a well-being phase. So managing students' well-being is obviously very critical, um, has been for some time, I know is a particularly poignant area for a lot of universities and is obviously particularly important at the moment. Um, so we've done a whole area that focuses on this, which we're gonna drill down into shortly. Then we have the evaluating progress, feedback and assessment phase, and then finally graduation. So we can't walk you through the detail of the entire target student experience today, because as you can see, there's a lot of detail in here and that would take a long time. 
Um, so we're just going to drill down into three areas. Um, we're going to, Rob's going to start with um, the, the, the first stage, so preparing and settling in. And then we're going to talk through the te teaching and learning, particularly in the virtual context. And then we're going to cover the mental health. So now I'm going to hand over to Rob. And we'll start with uh, Sam, who has just discovered that she has got into university. Yep, so we're starting this journey where Sam has been made an offer. So our first scene is all about the digital acceptance. As I'm sure you're aware, in times of uncertainty, proactive engagement and communication is absolutely essential. Our new applicants are already unclear on their results, and there's a need to provide a clear channel of communication to those you have made offers to. In this scenario, Sam has been accepted. And to be honest, it'd be a short presentation if she hadn't. She confirms her acceptance via her digital acceptance letter. We've then introduced the concept of an onboarding service, which ensures that clear communications engagement channel between her and the university. Now, we're aware that some of you are doing this already. We've been doing some research with uh, undergraduates and uh, potential uh, new applicants. And it tells us that some of you are already being proactive with those new applicants, running online sessions for prospective students with lecturers during lockdown. And in this scenario, Sam is downloading this onboarding service onto her mobile, which is her primary access device. We're now going to take a little look at what's in this onboarding service. At the top of the onboarding service, it has a countdown to her start date mechanism. X days to go till you arrive, till you become an undergraduate. And this mirrors a popular feature that many of the um, leisure companies and holiday companies use on their apps to get people excited about their imminent holiday starting. The onboarding service gives her access to a virtual campus. And we believe this concept of a virtual campus is important because it can begin to create a bond and a familiarity between the applicant and the physical environment we hope they'll be able to attend shortly. There are already some light examples of virtual campuses that we've seen. And we've also heard on the grapevine a number of universities are planning this for the new academic year. We'd also expect this onboarding service to give access to other key features like key tasks and content to provide Sam with the clarity of what she needed to do to prepare for a successful life at university. It could have a chatbot to answer key questions, a chatbot whose knowledge base grows as it understands the applicant's needs and as new information comes to light. This would also give her early and prominent visibility the wellbeing service, given the importance of this in this new normal and its uncertainty. And clearly alerts will be provided for key updates on what the new term might bring in line with both university and government policy. So some of you have or may be planning onboarding services already. At PA, we've developed onboarding services similar for this for corporate clients like Rolls-Royce and HSBC, which provide task lists for their new recruits, chatbots for queries and nudges and reminders for tasks and events. This runs on a platform that could potentially be adapted for university onboarding as well. Now back to Sam. She's engaging with the onboarding service and she now needs to grow her network and prepare for university life. So now we move on to how the app is helping her with connecting her with a buddy. Because we believe that creating person-to-person -person connections will be critical, especially when we're relying on a, on a digital environment. And we're seeing digital channels as being used heavily to help applicants create those all-important social and academic networks that will help them get off to the right start at university. In this scene, Sam is opting into the university's buddy scheme. It matches her with a current student who is already on her course. They can then, <coughs> excuse me, they can then chat on the onboarding service or continue their conversations in their own choice of channels. WhatsApp, for example, or similar. Some of you will, of course, already be doing this, and we believe this kind of network fostering is essential for the new normal. 
In the swim lanes above Sam, she has also used the onboarding service to select accommodation, complete with virtual tours, gain advice and tools to help her manage her finances, access pre-course resources and materials, and other content on what to expect from campus and university life. But we're short for time today and unfortunately can't go through those in any detail. So we now move on to the big day. Ordinarily, Sam would have been given clear directions of where to go, where to park, and which hall to go to. But in this lockdown, unfortunately, lockdown presides. And as ACME has pivoted to provide an undergraduate experience and an academic course for Sam's courses, she is able to start, albeit remotely. We want to make clear that despite the situation, this is a day to be celebrated and to welcome Sam to the university. The countdown has completed, it's happening now. You are an undergraduate. And as part of this, the onboarding app is reflecting that, delivering those messages, updating the virtual campus tour, pointing and directing her, signposting her to key events and sites that are happening on the virtual campus. The information Sam needs to know about the key academic year and how it will run for the short term under the current social distance rules and what she can expect. The onboarding app has now metamorphosized into her student portal app, a one-stop shop for all her communications and a key access point to other university resources and services. We then move on to the all-important Freshers' Fair. As before, it's really important that the digital twin of the university fosters networks and social connections. Yes, a virtual freshers' fair won't have the pizzazz of the real thing or those free slices of Domino's pizza, but we can still use these digital channels to connect sound to the societies and communities of interest to her and let her explore things new. In this example, we can see her looking through a carousel of societies in the top left-hand corner. And she's sorting through the drama section. She sees there's a circus society that intrigues her. And she can also see that it's on air. So she clicks through to investigate more and links through into their Zoom gathering to find out more. It was a really interesting experience for Sam with a lot to take in. And it was great for her to meet the circus crew. But for now, she's just going to opt for the drama society. It's not quite time for the big top for her now. And we know that some of you have a form of virtual freshers' fairs already, and that some of these are being enhanced in preparation for the new normal. Sam's feeling pretty embedded now, and she's getting ready to study. She's feeling more engaged and more connected with the university. She's met her university. She's met her buddy and her tutor. She's toured the campus. She's met some of her fellow course students and plenty of people at the virtual freshers' fair. Her social media contacts and followers have rapidly increased as a result. Her student portal is still a key point of engagement and communication. It is clear to her what she's done and what she needs to do next. It's the portal through which she will receive her turntable, updates in the light of corona and lockdown, and of course access to those all-important wellbeing services. And as I hope you agree, this onboarding at and student portal are valuable tools not only under lockdown, but they will help students, whether they're on campus or not, to, for, to prepare them for a successful student life and create a bond between them and the university, wherever they are. Now Sam's fully engaged, she has a growing network of friends, it's time for Sam to start studying. So we now move into the virtual and physical learning section and you can see here, we've got quite a lot um, under here, which, we, which we, we'd like to tell you about, but we can't go go into it all in a lot of detail. Um, we've got things in here like booking a lab space, booking space in the library to study or hiring specialist equipment like a camera. Um, but we're gonna focus on this line here, which is about the virtual learning because obviously this is a hot topic at the moment. So in Sam's digital portal, she can see what lectures she's got coming up and what format they're gonna be in. So she can see here, her next lecture is online and it's being run by her, by her tutor, Sarah. She can see the date and the time and that it's a video call. 
The lecture is held virtually with a chatbot who, which answers common questions throughout the lecture so that Sam can ask questions without disturbing the lecturer. And there are moderators who can manage the more complex questions as she goes through. For, for the more practical classes, which are obviously more challenging to do remotely, virtual reality has been introduced. This is provided by the university free of cost. She can order the headset through uh, her biology department and the cost has been included in her tuition fees. The VR set arrives at home and she's able, or, or wherever she's living, and she's able to attend the VR laboratory class with other students in her, cl in her class and the lecturer. The lectures are all professionally recorded and then they're uploaded to the digital portal. She can see upcoming seminars and she can go back and watch the ones from previously or ones that she's missed. And of course, this is constantly building up a big data profile. It's building up a profile of the lectures and seminars that Sam has attended, the questions that she's asked, um, and how generally she seems to be engaging with, with tasks and, and other work that's been set. A lot of universities, as you know, will have media suites which actually allow their lecturers to produce high quality production ready lectures that can be uploaded onto the learning widget and then the student will get notified when they're there. So moving out of the teaching and learning section, we're now going to move into managing your well-being, mental and physical health. So as part of the digital portal, students could have an option to opt in to a service that takes the pulse on how they're doing. So every day they could choose to click one of these faces that indicates whether they're, how they're feeling, whether they're happy, sad, etc. And they can put some comments in there as well. Alongside this, with the learning portal, there is a flagging system that flags up to, to Sam's tutor that her attendance has been low and that actually she's had a bit of a dip in her results as well. She's received her first D and her physical attendance at lectures has also dipped. So this raises a red flag for Sarah, her tutor, who starts to be a little bit concerned about Sam. Sarah gets this weekly performance email and she can see that her attendance has dropped. So she decides she's going to arrange a face to face meeting with Sam to discuss what's going on and why her performance has fallen. Through the online portal and tracking her well-being and how she's feeling, along with her grades and the fact that she hasn't been attending, Sam is starting to realise that something isn't quite right. And so she starts to look at the portal to see if there's anything anywhere that can give her some help. She searches for information that might help her with her anxiety and coping with exam stress. Lots of universities are using well-being apps already, and in this case, we've um, had Acme partnering with some well-being partners and Sam finds this through the app and she sees that there are, there are uh, specialists she can use who can help her with mental health issues, sleep therapy and nutrition and there's lots of articles that she can read as well to get some extra information that might help her. Sam accesses the university peer-to-peer -peer site service for students who can give each other support in difficult situations. The, cont the content is strictly monitored by mental health care professionals and posts are anonymous, so she knows it's a safe place to open up. And Sam finds this really helpful. Based on what she's searching for and her activity, a, a, a profile starts to be built around Sam. And this then sends her automated content and makes suggestions about other things that she could do to help herself in this scenario. She gets a notification that suggests that she might want to book an appointment with a clinical advisor. And this is where we meet Dr. Harrison. Dr. Harrison can look at the data that Sam has agreed to share. He can see how she's doing with her academic learning and he can also see um, that she's been using the app and she's had issues with anxiety um, and exam stress. Sam arranges several appointments with Dr Harrison regarding her ongoing anxiety. He gives her some really useful advice throughout this difficult time and recommends some effective exercises and mindfulness courses. 
With Sam's permission, Dr. Harrison also loops in Sam's tutor, Sarah, so they can discuss the problems that, that she's been having and agree a way forward to support Sam with her academic work. Sam gets a, an extended deadline. She manages to succeed in the work that was outstanding and she submits her assignment digitally using the assignment submission portal. She's able to check her work and add notes. And I think now we're going to move on to our second poll. Just before we do that, we're going to have a look at a quick summary of some of the key concepts that we've shown. So while Natalie switches screen, Natalie, you might have to unshare and share again, um, just in okay. case we get the freeze yeah. again. Um, so hopefully that uh, was insightful. We've shown you a number of scenes from that end to end, what we call a target student experience, and try to bring alive some of the key points we think are really relevant uh, to the new normal that, uh, that we're all struggling and anticipating that we're gonna have to adjust to for the new university term. Um, within that um, experience were a number of uh, key services, uh, key concepts, if you like, um, that uh, we thought were worth highlighting. <coughs> One, omnichannel, the ability to seamlessly switch between these digital and physical environments. That's going to be key. We don't want to create channel silos in this new world. Networking and collaboration, using digital to create person-to-person -person networks. It's one of the great things that digital has allowed us to do. Um, it's not just about a virtual world, it's about a connection between physical worlds free of physical constraints. And that's never going to be as important as it has been now. And the ability of those channels to allow people to collaborate, create a sense of belonging and community, which is going to be really key here. We've also covered a digital twin, a virtual version of the university, but clearly that needs to be recognized in an omnichannel context. We've spoken and Natalie specifically spoke about how we can use data to inform, act and automate. The queries that students have come in can be then fed into a chatbot so that those same queries can be answered automatically um, anytime 24 seven. And throughout this content is king, an empty web page, is, is just the same as, as anything else. It's useless and it poses more questions than it answers. So really strong focus on create, make, creating great content, creating relevant content and making it inspiring is key. And personalised, making sure we're relevant to each student and their needs, recognising, especially for those new applicants as they're becoming undergraduates, where they are on their journey, what their anxieties and worries are and what are the things they don't know, what are the things they need to act on. And all of these things, individually and collectively, need to articulate what's special about your university, your tone of voice and your culture. What we don't want is this digital physical world to have a physical world that makes everything vanilla. You want to carry through the things that are really important to you, your culture and your heritage and the way you connect to your students. So remember that when we're looking at the digital channels. As Natalie has uh, signposted, we'd now like to move into the next poll and uh, really in this one we wanted to get an idea of the, um, if you were planning to do any of the things we've touched on here, so hopefully you can see this. Which of the following of these are you planning to do? If you're already doing it, please click them as well. Um, be good to get a view. Uh, it's a couple, I'll wait for, for until a kind of number of you have kind of done this. Uh, while these numbers are coming up, uh, wow, remote seminars and digital onboarding are, are top of the list. Uh, top of the pops, omnichannel engagement is, is growing. It's, uh, it's like watching um, the, the Dolphin Derby at the fairground, watching these, uh, see who's going in the lead. Uh, we've got uh, some digital twins of campus, uh, virtual freshers fair, uh, but clearly the clear leaders coming out uh, in, in this. Um, our uh, digital onboarding, 78% of you, remote seminars for 88% of you, and omnichannel engagement is 66% of you, with virtual freshers fair not being, uh, not being far behind. So again, we'll um, distribute those poll results uh, in a follow-up to this, and hopefully that, uh, that uh, was, uh, is insightful and useful. Um, we're just now just going to move on to uh, the last bit of content before we go to the um, Q&A. 
um, because we shared a lot of concepts uh, there and from the uh, poll that we got here there are a number of things you're uh, looking to do. Um, so key on your mind is how do I accelerate delivery and succeed and we wanted to share some examples from our experience working across sectors of how organizations have done that. First up is adopting agile approaches and we have a mantra that we use often called think big start small and scale fast. Thinking big is about thinking differently, being ambitious. What it is not about is spending six, nine, twelve months thinking and not doing because we are impatient. We have a maker's mindset at PA so we like to create things as so things create outcomes. So we like to look at the things we can start small. And the TSE that we've shown, the target student experience, you could see that you could take concepts from that, break them off into chunks and start delivering them to making small things and scaling them fast. We've seen great examples of how people have done that with automation, with AI, with chatbot, with digital services, with data platforms. This is a really good approach. And to do that, we're often having to break down structural challenges and internal silos. Those silos and structural challenges aren't unique to universities. They're common in almost every organization, but they are particularly prevalent in universities from my experience. Those structural, those structural difference, the collaboration has to be both across the academic faculties and schools, as well as the other departments, the technology, the communications, everybody's got to collaborate and work together side by side, not in parallel tracks, but together in a multidisciplinary way. And for that to happen, we've got to have governance uh, fine-tuned to let that happen. We can't be in a world where we're delivering papers into boards two or three weeks in advance. There simply isn't time when we've got to respond to a government announcement in the next 24 hours. So we've got to empower people to make the decision. We've got to streamline our governance so it allows us to do the right things with the right guide rails in place. And moving on to the right hand side, we've got to ensure that we consider this as a business initiative and not just IT. This is going to mean a change to policies, processes, the roles of people, the way they behave. And as you have been adapting already to COVID-19, you'll see those roles beginning to change. And it's not just about the technology, it's how the business behaves, the organisation behaves and Rohans is absolutely critical. So make sure we recognise this. Some of the things we've shared and we've touched on a couple, the well-being app, on-being app, some of these are existing platforms. Exploit those platforms. They will help you accelerate delivery. And if you've got access to licenses, free licenses or available licenses, you know, look and use them. But be aware that some of them might put you in a future legacy trap. But look at what you have available. What are the building blocks? What are the Lego blocks you've got that you can use to, to build this new experience for the uncertainty that we expect shortly? And lastly, please don't forget the people. Engage your users early, engage them often, learn from them, build advocacy with the team, developing the services and build advocacy with the user groups as well. So those were our key tips on how to accelerate delivery and succeed. Um, we thought it'd be interesting with our last poll just to see which of these things you're uh, doing to in order to uh, respond to the new normal. So uh, if we could have the last poll, please. And again, this is a multiple choice. <coughs> so agile and user needs, that's uh, really pleasing. Those are some of the key things that, uh, that we believe in. Collaboration is key. Multidisciplinary approaches and streamlining governance slightly, uh, slightly uh, lagging behind, which I think is, uh, is interesting. That's great. That's 46 responses. So um, yeah, it's, uh, some very interesting, pretty even, uh, but less in governance and multidisciplinary approaches. So um, I'd be interested for you ready already or end of our um, content and polling back to Natalie to uh, to show us where we are.
Thanks, Rob. Thanks, everyone, for doing that, Paul. So just to recap on what we've covered so far this afternoon. Um, first of all, we've talked through why things need to change and not just because of COVID-19. Uh, secondly, we talked about what the 2020-2021 experience might look like for the student. And thirdly, we talked about how to accelerate delivery for this new normal. Uh, so finally, we're going to move on to the Q&A session. Um, and thank you very much. I can see that you've been busy posting questions um, in the chat. I'd also like to take this opportunity to um, introduce Paul Woodgate, who is the lead for our higher education team at PA. Um, he is also on the conference call and will be able to take some questions as well if they're more on the education than the digital side of things. So, um, Rob, I think you're going to pick up the first question. Okay, I'm looking at the Q&A and not the chat, so um, let me... And I'm going to have to reduce this so that I can see the chat as well. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions on the chat yet. Or on the Q&A. Okay, I can see lots. So, oh. oh no, they're just they're just technical questions. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we don't have any questions from people who are on the webinar. Uh, while while people are thinking of questions, um, I guess some reflection on the polls. So, first poll we shared um, on how ready people are. I think the majority of you planning, starting, executing, but clear that there's there's uh, there's uncertainty and uh, very few of you kind of um, feeling confident that you've got everything in place and I think that's to be expected and then when we reflect on the last poll um, uh, where we had uh, a lot of responses uh, for agile I think uh, even those of you who may not have considered that you were an agile organization have um, had to become one in order to attach uh, to what's been happening over the last couple of months uh, the response to those uh, uh, to the government announcements, to the initiatives, to to the to the state of students, to your the way you can support um, uh, kind of COVID nineteen in terms of research and accommodation. So you have been pivoting and uh, delivering in an agile way, and I imagine that's increased collaboration across departments, which I'm sure you have to a certain extent, but maybe that's increased um, as you've been moving forward. And I think on the other poll, it was uh, really interesting to see many of the things that uh, you're already planning to do. Um, quite a lot in terms of onboarding and virtual seminars, that was, that, that was good to see. Uh, and a large number uh, looking at, uh, uh, at um, how you could uh, uh, deliver an omnichannel environment. Um, I'm sure there must be some questions out there. <laughs> Can people, I, I guess, can everybody, uh, everybody has access to the Q&A? Thank you. Yes, thank you, anonymous attendee. Yes, there is, there is access to the, uh, to the Q&A. <laughs> but still no questions. No questions. <laughs> can I, as Paul Woodgate said, can I offer a reflection, if I may, which uh, uh, might be just uh, perhaps prompt some questions. Uh, in, in this uh, this time of, uh, of of difficulty and crisis, I think all universities are having to balance the um, the the long term with the short term. So far, for the last few weeks, most universities have been have been have done a really strong job at getting uh, lectures online, getting interaction with students, allowing uh, the, the ordinary day-to-day -day processes of the university to operate. I think there's now a sort of second phase of activity, which is all about um, uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 new, the next academic year and how that, uh, the admission cycle will complete uh, and, and uh, how we can uh, uh, smooth the path of of uh, students uh, uh, starting the next academic year with, with two objectives. One is to make it better for them, but also the other is to make sure that they do come. 
and uh, that, that student numbers are, are at a sustainable level for next year. But then there's a third piece, which is around the long term delivery of genuine change to student experience. The sort of thing that, as, as you said at the beginning of this, Rob, that we were thinking about only a few weeks ago. And uh, it's really hard, I think, for universities to balance the need to um, uh, maintain that long term vision of the direction that they're traveling in, the way they make the student experience better, the way that they use technology to meet student needs, but also uh, run the institution more effectively, but at the same time deal with the short term crisis of, of, of uh, that has been really short term so far about uh, dealing with students who are on campus who can't get home and those sorts of things, but and, and need to for others who need to attend lectures. And this, the intermediate piece, which is about next September. And balancing those perspectives, I think, is really, really tough for universities to do at the moment. Uh, and, and, and maintaining that long term vision is, is, is clearly very important so that universities are thinking about how they uh, do the short term things in the context of a long term uh, a set of decisions about the technology route, about the way that they're improving experiences and so on. I'm hoping that might prompt some questions from. Uh, from from the uh, from the from the uh, webinar, and we have a question. Well, yeah, we do have a first question. Um, I'll take that. So, thank you, Rasheen. So, uh, many thanks for the feedback on the webinar. Um, I'll just read it out to everyone so they're clear. Do we have any tips on how we apply the learnings and approach universities are taking for student experience, and to apply it to the employee experience? I'm always curious about how we take best practice to both be benefit both important groups of people. Um, ab absolutely. Um, in the scenario that we shared today we particularly focus on SAM but we can also and we have done um, in our total student experience models focused uh, with an equal balance between the two and often with a stronger focus on the internal audiences. Uh, for us this is all about focusing on, on the humans in the process and making sure that we've got that clear view end to end. So absolutely uh, yes. Uh, so how do we apply the learnings and approach to the employee experience. I think some of those things around uh, well-being are still uh, kind of hang true. The need to communicate and engage on a regular basis is, is absolutely uh, critical, making sure you've got the right uh, channels to do that. And again, not having uh, those, those bridges between the uh, physical and the digital. So a lot of the key concepts, I think, roll out across, across both groups and also maintaining the dynamic between those groups is important for both. Rob, shall I pick up the second question? Please do. Uh, so, um, Gassan, thank you. So, Gassan said, um, uh, you mentioned a creation, as creating a seamless connection between the physical and the digital ecosystems rather than creating silos where you need to move between one or another. Can you elaborate more on how? So, what we're talking about here is um, is sort of trying to link link up the physical experience that students are having on campus in lecture theatres with the digital portal that we described in the target student experience. So an example of that would be um, as a student I arrive in the lecture theatre, I scan my phone as I walk in and therefore my uh, digital portal automatically knows that I've gone into this lecture, this, this building at this time, um, and, it, and then I automatically get a link on, uh, a link on my um, phone that shows me the, um, the, the, the lecture that I'm in, what time it is, who, who the lecturer is, um, links to any notes, um, an area where I can be asking questions live during that lecture. Um, as we showed to, to other students, FAQs, it might be a chatbot. Um, that are enhancing my physical experience in that lecture theatre. I then might be able to do to arrange a follow up session with that with that lecturer or with other students to go away and talk further on the subject that I've just learned about. Um, I might be able to rate that lecture or give feedback on it. Controversial, but you know, always good to have feedback on these things and 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 and, and track that data too. Um, Similarly, with libraries, you know, um, being able to reserve a book from my portal from my phone that I can then go and pick up and then maybe my phone notifies me to tell to tell me, you know, that book is due back in two days time and then it's one day time. Don't forget to, to drop the book back to the library. Similarly, with booking equipment and physical space, I might need a space to go and rehearse in or a lab 
to go and, and do work in and I might need a, a camera or other specialist equipment that again I can book out electronically and then physically go and, and pick up. Um, hopefully that helps a bit. And then I think we've had another question, Rob. Oh, it's just arrived. I'm interested in how we create a sustainable ecosystem for this. How do we ensure equal success to digital services and how do we rethink the package students and staff receive? Laptop provided as part of onboarding, reduces support costs, provides access to all. I think this is a uh, this is a really interesting, really interesting question, and we began to uh, touch on uh, uh, touch on that in the virtual lecture uh, piece. Um, absolutely, we can't assume that uh, everybody has all the equipment they need to, to to connect, and also we know that some students, while they're um, in remote areas are, are suffering uh, with access. But I think uh, it's right here. If we kind of look at the uh, some of the uh, costs of technology, the, the access to technology, and um, you know potentially the, the, the fees that students are paying, then then there can be a rationale to include some equipment in some of these packages and certainly support access to that. And I think that applies, as you put it in your note, Um, and not students, uh, students and, and staff because um, if people don't have access then this thing breaks down and um, I think uh, many of you have seen um, some of the regional authorities or and I saw there was a, a Twitter a tweet out um, from Digital Scotland where they're getting uh, equipment out to some of their um, key communities who don't have access to the digital technology they need to remain interconnection so I think this is a key part of thinking it a lot of people will have the equipment and the connection but for those who do don't how do universities uh, kind of fill that gap um, and how yes how do we make it a, a sustain a sustainable one both, both both economically and in terms of the the parts and the the equipment that are provided Thanks, Rob. I'm going to pick up the next question from Emma. Thanks for your question. So Emma's asking about focusing on the idea of balance. We obviously want to provide an excellent student experience, but this is pressured as we need to be ready for September. As we start to improve our remote services, how do we know that the experiences are excellent and not just good enough for now? due to the pressures? It's a really good question because obviously um, you're battling between having to just have something ready as quickly as possible, um, um, but also wanting to, to build something that's really, really good. I think that's the great thing about um, agile working and digital technology is that we're always focused on building the minimum viable product. Um, so rap working in rapid iterations where we can spin something up very quickly, test it, and then iterate it and continuously improve it. So it might be that you go live with a minimum viable product for September, but that that can be continuously iterated and improved upon. However, in the digital world, you know, September is, is still actually quite far away. We've got most of May, June, July and August, and actually three months in the digital world, again, is quite a long time to spin up a, a new digital product. And the other piece of advice that I would give you is just to ensure that whatever you build and whatever you design is putting at the center of that design. So test it with them. Um, everything you build, make sure it's based on what they need and test it and, and, and check that by actually asking them. So take the product, show it to them. What do you think? What could be better? Because obviously the students are going to probably be the biggest critics of any digital technology that's introduced in the university because they're primarily going to be um, younger people who are, are very, very digitally savvy. And we have to think about what good looks like from their perspective. And good looks like the tools that they use every day, um, you know, Snapchat, Instagram, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to put ourselves in their shoes. And the best way to do that is to work with them, get them involved in testing as you build these products. Because if you don't, then what you launch won't service their needs. Natalie, I wonder if I could just add one thing to that. that sure. That's all absolutely correct. But I, I think there's also it's important to see this not as a sort of one off step from from where you are now to excellence. Uh, you know, what, whatever you build now will need to change. That's the, the kind of the beauty of this kind of approach. You can constantly refine. Uh, new ideas will come up, new technologies will emerge, just new ways of working in other sectors that you can borrow and and improve the, the digital experience. So. 
almost regardless of how well you do for, for, for say, digital onboarding or Freshers Fair or whatever it might be for, for this September, by next September, there'll be different things you can do. So it, there's not really a choice between doing it excellent or, or doing it good enough. You can do as good as you can, but it will still need to continue to develop as you get new ideas and as you get the kind of feedback from how well it works and, and think of new things that you can do. It needs to be seen as a sort of continual process of improvement. Thanks, Paul. Um, Catherine, do you want us to take one final question? Yeah, I was just going to say, we, uh, we're, we're almost coming up to time now, but I see we do have one final question, so perhaps if we could take a look at that and then uh, we can wrap up. Okay. Hey, so this one's from Lee. We're all being pulled in many different directions. I'm sure we can all recognise that as we need to respond to the impacts of crisis. The same is true for our users. The making reasonable ask of our participants' time is even more imperative than ever. How can we ensure, whoa, it's moved now. Ah, yes, um, it's being voted up, so it's moving while I'm reading it. How can we ensure user feedback is gathered effectively when testing and iterating uh, due, during this time? Um, uh, uh, great, great question. I think, um, you know, good. Uh, so there are a number of ways to do this. Some of the user feedback that we collect when we're doing user research um, is, uh, I'll use the phrase face-to-face. -face. Um, clearly, when we're doing user research in this time, uh, we're doing a lot of that remotely. And uh, Natalie uh, leads a team that have been doing that across the globe, testing digital services with people on every continent of the world in user testing. And those, those aren't uh, enormous day-long sessions. Those are short, precise sessions where people are clear on the answers that they need to check to get the feedback they need on their services. Uh, there is also a rule of thumb that, uh, you know, somewhere around around eight users of your, your key service are enough to get 80% of the feedback you need. So it doesn't have to be a mass group. I think the other thing is using the data on the services. So a lot of the work that we've done in public digital sector uh, puts the services live and uses the data to collect the feedback in real time. So it's not just about observing, it's checking, as kind of Paul, Paul has kind of touched on, uh, what can we learn from the data of how people used it to, to, to build it? What are the other ways that we can kind of collect, collect, uh, collect that impact? Um, I realise we just have to make the best use of the time that is available and use all of the different research and uh, analytical means to get that feedback to the product team. Uh, Lee, I hope that answered your question. Catherine, you're keeping us good to time. And you're on mute. Rookie error there, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much indeed, um, Rob and Natalie, and indeed Paul for, for your presentation. And uh, thanks everyone for participating in the polls and uh, for, your, for your questions. I must say, I think if there'd been a circus society when I was at uh, university, my uh, career might have taken a whole different trajectory. Um, anyway, thanks very much indeed. If I could just take this um, opportunity very quickly to mention a couple of uh, forthcoming webinars we've got coming along. Um, on the 19th of May, um, we've got uh, Andy Yule and Alex Lee who will be talking about data and what universities will need to do um, about data in the post-COVID world. And then on the 3rd of June, we've got uh, a webinar looking at the financial impact of the virus uh, and that will have panellists from the AHUA. So there's more information about uh, both of those webinars on our website. So um, thank you very much again, um, and I hope that you might be able to join us uh, on a future event. Thank you, and uh, bye for now. <laughs>